Welcome to the last of the three webinars on demand as root cause for human trafficking. Today, we shall discuss technology, the role of technology in human trafficking. On behalf of the Order of Malta, I would like to thank Brian Islin for his active participation in the organization of this webinar. As you know, Brian Islin, founder and CEO of Slave Free Trade, is a pioneer in the demand approach against human trafficking and specialist in the control of supply chains through technology with 25 years of field experience against human trafficking. My thanks also to Sister Miriam Paike for her help in the preparation for, of this and previous webinars. Technology, as we shall discuss it today, can be used to trap as well as to protect victims. We should speak, or we could speak, of the use and misuse of technology in human trafficking. Today, we are very fortunate to have four distinguished speakers. First, Brian Islin, who will be moderator and speaker, former Australian soldier and federal agent, founder of the NGO Slave Free Trade, working on eliminating modern slavery on the workplace. Then, Andrea Marchesani, Special Advisor of the Order of Malta and also member of the Migrants and Refugees Section and Integral Human, Human Development Dicastery of the Holy See. The third speaker is Don Fortunato Di Noto, Catholic Session Priest, President of the Meter Association. In the dark and insidious part of the web, he is engaged in the fight against the crime of pedophilia and child pornography. And the fourth speaker is Sean Cole, Director for Central and Eastern Europe for International Justice Mission, IGM, a human rights agency that secures justice for victims of slavery, sexual exploitation and other forms of violent oppression. Documents related to technology and human trafficking can be found and downloaded in the handouts next to the chat at the top right of your screen. A special thanks again to Brian Islin, who is now taking over as moderator. Brian, you have the floor. So thanks very much, Michelle, and welcome everybody to this webinar on the role of technology in addressing demand in human trafficking. I want to kick off this session with a plea for some clarity and use my time, I hope wisely, to address something I'd noticed before, but which really came into specific relief while researching for this webinar. While looking for evidence of impact, outcomes and sustainability data from the major tech against trafficking projects, I actually found none universally. What I did find, however, was how so many projects they claim to be contributing to ending, eliminating or eradicating trafficking. Now, the terms that are used to describe actions being taken, for the most part, are frankly a little bit hysterical. You find eliminate, fight, end, eradicate, tackle, war against. It's all tough talk and I think it's, you know, very political. But what does it mean? A quick scan of initiatives, especially in the tech world, at the terms used, just shows to me that there's very little thought about the meaning and impact of those words beyond some kind of sensationalism. Now, my plea is that before using these terms to describe an initiative, I would ask people to consider the realistic impact a single initiative can lay claim to. And is the claim accurate or, or hyperbole? Now, if you're working to support victims of trafficking, you're not ending, eradicating or eliminating modern slavery. You're helping victims, you're cleaning up and you're undoubtedly doing good, but you're not ending, eradicating or eliminating. If you're doing anything on the supply side, in fact, like rescues, identifying victims, police or intelligence operations, poverty reduction, you're not ending or eliminating modern slavery. You are at best addressing vulnerabilities and cleaning up. You may even be confronting it or attacking it if that language is exciting for you, but you aren't ending it, eradicating or eliminating. If you're working on reducing demand for a form of human trafficking, 
you may honestly say you are working to end or eliminate or eradicate, but it's only on the demand side, which is why this webinar is so important. And this series of webinars on demand is so important. Let me be clear, there is not a single supply side measure that can ever hope to end, eliminate or eradicate. If you work on the supply side, just stop using that language, it's hyperbole. The reason I raise it is actually bigger than the fact that it's hyperbole, the, the fact that it's sloppy and sensationalist. It's confusing to consumers. It's confusing to donors. It's confusing, especially to policymakers. And crucially, what we end up with is funds that should be used to ending, eliminating or eradicating modern slavery being used to clean up or to address vulnerabilities. It's behavior that distorts policy and priorities. And overall, I think it leads to a global lack of impact. So now, now that I've got that off my chest, uh, I'd like to be able to talk about one of the only demand side tech projects out there. I don't know whether you know the phrase, the Latin phrase, esse quam videri, to be, not to seem. Now, this is the motto of Slave Free Trade, a Swiss non-profit association I formed at the end of 2018. The meaning of this motto is at the heart of the initiative. I've been working decades on slavery operations in supply chains, and largely I found that businesses are content with seeming to be doing something, not actually doing something. And by and large, stakeholders, including consumers, procurement agencies, shareholders, and investors are content with the seeming. I'm happy to report, I think, that this has changed. The world is now kind of a buzz with initiatives in the business, UN, and nonprofit world to come to terms with an increasingly engaged, maybe we could even say sometimes agitated, community of stakeholders interested in human rights performance and risk in business. We're seeing shareholder revolts over serial sexual harassment. We're seeing child labor scandals in major clothing brands and the promotion of sustainability professionals into key leadership roles in companies. Human rights are suddenly coming into focus a bit more. It would be going too far to say there is momentum, but perhaps we can agree that there is at least movement. And this movement coincides with significant legislative movement in that direction, from the Modern Slavery Act sweeping the Anglophone world to human, human rights due diligence models in the Francophone and the European world. Now, taking a step back to take in the view, the corporate world, which was formerly content to use its blend of structural, instrumental, let's say discursive power to hold back the forces of change in their business model, are finding that position less tenable. Clever businesses, those with an eye on the emerging world, are exploring what that wave of change means to them and what they need to do to ride it. How does a business be and not just seem to be interested in human rights in workplaces? The first step, as Socrates said, to wisdom is to know thyself. Now, if you're interested in human rights in workplaces, it can't be only about them and over there. That's called othering, and it's the very core of the belief that we're better than everyone else. And it also is the foundation that we think we are beyond reproach. If you genuinely care about human rights in workplaces, start at home. Human rights issues don't just happen over there. Witness the Me Too movement and the BLM movement. So let's start with some background on the actual problem we're addressing here. Universally, we condemn modern slavery, and we've talked about this in past webinars, and we prohibit it, and yet we all buy it. We touch modern slavery every day more often than we actually touch our faces, and thanks to COVID, we've become very aware of how much we touch our faces every day. Slavery, encompassing the legal conditions of child labor, human trafficking, forced labor, slavery and servitude, is now more prevalent than at any time in history, and we've heard these numbers over the past few weeks. 77% of UK businesses, when given anonymity, admit modern slavery exists in their business. Historically, we are used to modern slavery being addressed as a form of organized crime. Well, historically, since the year 2000. 
but that conceptualization is far from actually accurate. the vast majority of the world's human rights issues in workplaces forced labor, child labor, slavery and servitude have little or nothing to do with organized crime and law enforcement in fact can never solve modern slavery anyway so law enforcement or crime focused approach is not the solution modern slavery is actually best understood as that kind of bad eroded end of a spectrum of human rights in workplaces the spectrum being from modern slavery to decent work now if you can objectively prove a workplace is at the decent work end of the spectrum modern slavery will not be present you cannot be at opposite ends of the same spectrum at the same time so if we can automate and scale rigorous real-time processes to understand exactly what's happening in a workplace we can determine whether they are at the decent work end or the modern slavery end so we can do this through assessing and monitoring conditions in real time and what I propose, what I am developing, is a carefully selected set of 100 indicators derived exclusively from international human rights law. So for this exercise, picture a long row of 100 escalators in a mall running off into the distance. At the foot of these escalators is the murky swamp of modern slavery. At the top of the escalators is this world of decent work. Now what if I told you, you could know at all times which step you are on for each of those 100 escalators and whether you're moving up or down. Well, that's the project Slave Free Trade. So we're a Swiss nonprofit association and what we want to do is ferment a new global economy exclusively for goods and services proved to have been made without harming anyone. And we do that through harnessing demand. We envision a world in which an investor can scroll through the New York Stock Exchange Connect app and see exactly which companies are human rights friendly and risk free. In that same world, a millennial looking at a job in Glassdoor can readily identify a human rights friendly employer. A shopper looking at prawns or chocolate in a supermarket can know which ones have not harmed anyone in the making. A procurement agency, the Ministry of Defense, evaluating bids for army boots can see at a glance the human rights performance of the maker. This is harnessing demand. Libertas, it's a rights tech project of slave free trade. It's the use of technology to extend, expand and promote human rights. It's an initiative designed to provide the scalable tools for the mission of that new economy. It's a distributed, we call it, it's a technical term, it's a distributed human rights intelligence system. It's designed specifically to drive demand for human rights friendly workplaces globally. It harnesses the compelling power of primary source data from workplaces, that's individual views and organizational perspectives alike. It analyzes and distributes the resulting decision intelligence to those whose buying and business decisions can be influenced by that data. Our approach is not to prove modern slavery exists in workplaces. That's what I've been doing the last 20 years and it's completely unscalable. But actually our approach is to prove modern slavery doesn't exist in workplaces. And that sounds like such an easy flip, right? But this is actually a watershed moment. This is, this shift signals a, a, a move from a treatment model to a vaccination model. Instead of treating each case after it's happened, we prove and create a culture of respect for human rights in a workplace, ushering in a world of workplaces that are impervious, vaccinated against modern slavery. So Slave Free Trade is an initiative designed with systems thinking to overcome and avoid many of the problematic issues and concerns around all existing methods. So up until now, human rights defied quantification. So Libertas quantifies human rights, which means we're able to monitor, assess and compare in a way that's completely agnostic to product, geography, industry, socioeconomic conditions. Existing responses like rescues and audits and investigations like I've been doing cannot scale. They're labor intensive, they're expensive. So Libertas is designed to be scalable, remote, cheap, global coverage 
and 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 takes out intermediaries from the system where 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 failure often comes. Current models, most of you who know about audit will support me on this, are easily defeated and defrauded. Fraud, false statements, coercion, collusion, greenwashing are commonplace, uh, and the Libertas model counters all of those conditions. I think most of you would also believe and understand that staff are largely ignored or voiceless in the majority of existing initiatives. There is no comprehensive canvassing of views of workers in B Corp, Fair Trade, Global Reporting Initiative, sustainability initiatives like Ecovatis and Sustainalytics and so on. They can't universally canvass workplaces. And so the staff are ignored or voiceless. You're, you're pretty much capturing only the corporate view. So Libertas amplifies the voices of those in workplaces in support of their own conditions and in support of the improvement of those conditions. Now, up until now, power and commodity chains has been very unbalanced and very unfair. So Libertas has a democratizing effect. The staff working in the global value and commodity chains are the overwhelming majority of people in those chains. Their voices do matter, but they're not being canvassed until now. Now, supply chains are disaggregated, complex, globalized, opaque. These are the sorts of words we tend to hear about supply chains. So Libertas converts opaque chains, disaggregated networks, to collaborative networks by making each establishment in a business network dependent on the human rights performance of the others. So suddenly a three tier supply chain, each of the partners, each of the companies in that chain become partners. They understand each other's human rights conditions. They are much more visible and uh, uh, much more transparent than ever before. And they actually start to become interested in each other's commercial interests, uh, human rights interests. So human rights have been treated previously as separate from the normal conduct of business and they've been put off in CSR and ESG or sustainability initiatives. So Libertas embeds human rights into the bottom line. In-person audits or investigations, especially on sensitive topics like human rights, don't get the best answers. Libertas generates trust because the entire system is built on anonymity and confidentiality. Importantly for the demand side initiatives, stakeholders like consumers, procurers, investors, they have not had tangible actions that express their values through buying decisions. So Libertas informs them with timely, actionable decision intelligence, including consumers at point of sale, procurers at point of bid, and investors at point of investment. Existing measures like rescue, surveillance, audit, law enforcement, investigations, as I've said before, these are labor intensive and expensive and you can't scale them. If we're going to get, if we're going to eliminate 152 million children from child labor, if we're going to address that properly, we've got to have a scale that can, a solution that can scale almost infinitely. Most measures on social, social sustainable, socially sustainable business are top down. This makes it look and feel to workers like fundamental human rights are actually alienable, not inalienable, and something that should be bestowed on them by the employer. And slave-free trade, however, is human-centric and inclusive. It's really important that people in workplaces realize their rights are not something that the employer can take away from them. Putting the emphasis on remote data collection and analysis doesn't eliminate the need for human intervention. But remote monitoring like this becomes the new, more comprehensive and more effective default. And so this change ushers in a scalable default, only limited by two things, actually, goodwill and data storage. Certification schemes are also very expensive for small businesses. Many smallholders can't join. Uh, membership exceeds their ability to pay. In the slave free trade model, smallholders are free. Implementation costs are negligible. There's no hardware or setup costs. Libertas runs in a simple browser, mobile application, uh, or with API integrations for different audiences. If you could hypothetically scale to the global audit workforce required, if we wanted to make audit the, the real effective default, uh, the cost to match what we can do would easily be many millions and potentially even billions of dollars a year 
compared to in our system a mere few thousand so no existing model has had that level of uh, 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 well lack of expense let's say to make it possible to do these things on a scale and no existing model has a universal international human rights law framework this is, makes it the first deployable definition for decent work it's agnostic to geography good service product jurisdiction language power I mean it doesn't matter what Bangladesh says living wage is we're talking about harnessing the views of the people in the workplace about their lived experience the first piece of our project to capture consumer demand and I'm, I'm winding up here uh, and feed that through to businesses to join and become human rights compliant is what we call the Freedomer app so this is a smartphone application which has two phases we've currently designed we've, we've designed and we are currently crowdfunding the coding of phase one now phase one is a, of this app is a demand aggregator so at the moment businesses say their customers don't care which is actually crap the fact is consumers uh, let's talk just you and I for a start we care what we don't have is a reliable way to tell them that we care and we don't have a way to join our voices with others to say that we all care so the freedom app does this a campaigning app you put in products that you want to be slave free like Levi's 502s and others are then invited to join your campaign when we have sufficient signatures to make an appeal to a brand we do it on behalf of the let's say thousands of signatories in the app so the thing is that you care I care lots of people care but our voices are not joined up so the freedom app is the first time a tool has been developed to do that so I would ask before I move on to the, to, to the other panelists help us bring the freedom app into your hands and then we can all harness the power of our own demand for a collective good so I'd ask you to go to we make uh, and look for slave free trades crowdfund there's just seven days to go where I think we're on 79% or something like that so um, uh, the point there is that you can be the difference you can actually take take it take a part right now well as soon as we deliver it you can take a part every day in providing uh, a growing demand for uh, the end of trafficking and modern slavery so without any further ado you've heard enough from me we're pleased to bring you a number of great panelists tonight to talk about what they're doing what they've seen and if I may be so bold to predict what they see we need or might even they know might even be things they know are coming down the pipeline so without further ado we'll launch straight to our first speaker uh, please welcome uh, Andrea Marcassani whose intervention tonight is in his capacity with the Order of Malta as an advisor to the Foreign Affairs Department of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. Andrea, over to you. Uh, so, uh, as you, as you, as you use, as you say it, uh, we, what we see and what is happening and uh, and what is happening with the covid crisis that exacerbated the all this huge war that is internet and uh, the migrants and refugee section of the OLC a few years ago published the pastoral orientations to uh, on human trafficking in after a process of listening to local churches and to catholic organizations and partners on on this specific issue and uh, would my it, uh, it would my pleasure tonight to transfer these pastoral orientations on um, general human trafficking on the human trafficking uh, in the digital world in the in and the role of the of technology uh, so I would like to start to to quote the Pope in the last in his last encyclical uh, Fratelli Tutti. At the point 24, he mentioned clearly the using of modern means of communication to lure young men, men and women uh, in the human in uh, the human trafficking networks, and uh, he, he calls for a global effort to eradicate human trafficking. So, but um, after this intervention in the Fratelli Tutti in 2002, John Paul II uh, individuated three uh, the, the problems 
coming up with the globalization and the trade related to the trade in human beings. And we can say that the three M's of globalization, market, media and migrations are the perfect, uh, is the perfect, um, they form the perfect macro context for human trafficking because the uh, human trafficking evolved in a different way in these three channels. So, uh, we can say, as we know, that uh, the virtual territory is a problematic to be controlled by uh, by security, by police, by uh, the states, because it's a huge war, and uh, we can say that only one percent of internet is uh, in this. Uh, there, are, there is the Google is uh, control just one percent of the of what we can find on internet. Uh, so these are what Don Fortunato called the, the, the digital peripheries, peripheries and uh, Pope, these are the same peripheries, the existential peripheries that Pope Francis invite the church to live in and to save and to help people in. So uh, passing to the uh, pastoral orientation, uh, we divide in the work that the section, the only, the only section, uh, the only C uh, section for migrants and refugees prepare. The first, uh, the first uh, chapters was about uh, understanding the human trafficking causes, and so the commodification and exploitation, the demand aspect. And so if in the human trafficking, generally we have a commodification and the person became a, a commodity, an, ob an object, in human trafficking in the digital peripheries, we have a, a next level commodification. So, um, and the human person, not just an object, but become an amount of the, becomes an amount of data, videos and picture, which are transferable and the virtual abuse can be perpetrated an exponential number of times in different places on earth. So not just once, but the dignity of the human being is violated several times, this, the same dignity. And this what was maybe is, was it is, uh, Martin Heidegger defined the essence of technology. So, the old distances in time and space are shrinking and technology change uh, the borders and allow the, the, the man to become an amount of data and to, ma to be manipulated many times. And uh, we can uh, link to this what the Pope uh, called the widespread of growing digital narcissism in his uh, message for the World Youth Day in 2020. So the, it, this is a next level, an exacerbation of the reality of nature and things and person because technologies create the means and we are not uh, even, we are not even, we are not in control of this. So uh, after the demand aspect, the, the second uh, part of this first uh, ch chapter of the past orientation is the, uh, the demand aspect. And the demand is not so far from us. Uh, is, is in our house, homes, houses, uh, in our families, because technologies are invasive. They enter in our, in our lives and we see human trafficking without seeing it. So acknowledging human trafficking there is like a blanket of fog hiding the phenomenon, but at the same time is in plain sight because uh, every time that we enter in uh, on internet and we go, I don't know, on Instagram, on other social networks, we can look, we can see human trafficking without seeing it because uh, these are all channels used to lure people. In Italy was, was, uh, in the last years, there, there were many cases of luring on Facebook, on Instagram, on, on other, uh, on other social networks and cyber trafficking, uh, for, uh, target mainly people in that uh, their experiences 
uh, different difficult uh, difficult times or they are the most vulnerable like children or that are excluded or ne neglected or they don't have any friends and uh, f uh, this use of facebook and social network were used also in uh, in uh, for in migration uh, issues for instance scotland yard discovered that uh, they found 539 pages on Facebook offering uh, offering uh, s safe, not so safe, routes to Europe with discounts for minors, and this is for migrants. So uh, another strategy util uh, used on uh, social networks, people, uh, traffickers identify the victims, Add friends in common, gain trust, and after always they 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 target these most vulnerable people. Another chapter could be uh, could be that is very near, that is in our homes, that is around us uh, is the pornography. Pornography uh, there is a normal a normalization, a cultural normalization of pornography, but in, in pornography the position of the Catholic Church that is already human trafficking even without coercion because it damaged and destroyed the, the dignity of human being that became that becomes a mere object of pleasure for others, for third parties for many times. And, um, and also in this world, the most search a term on these uh, pornography portraits are always are usually youth and teens categories and in that in that case we have human trafficking as well for for international protocols not only for a catholic church and um, and many times the the borders between pornography and, uh, and coercion and prostitution are very thin there are many cases Expose of uh, pornography industries and producers that they coerce their actors to be to be to to be prostitutes as well. So uh, the 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 sexual uh, searches on internet four millions four millions of these uh, web searches if, uh, look for youth categories. To be to keep in mind, but also adults can be lured in lure in this world, and is very difficult to 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 escape this. So um, for the, uh, the the dynamics, this is the second. I I will not talk about dark web and deep web because are very <laughs> big words, and I I think maybe Don Fortunato later will will uh, will focus more on on this. Um, but this is a huge war of of uh, websites of spaces and uh, sharing file platforms where are not even control checked and they can not be supervised by police force maybe from from stakeholders web stakeholder yes but it's very difficult so uh, about the uh, the the dynamics the the dynamics uh, and uh, there is a, a there is a problem this opens the sensitive issue of web and it companies responsibility because the, the internet world is so connected is of course connected is internet and uh, but the the the, the business uh, it in measure on uh, likability, if I can use this word, on uh, on how, how how many times people visualize uh, and watch uh, content, and uh, the the profit uh, uh, boggles the mind, and the, the profit increase m m increase uh, as more people watch something. So uh, there is no interest for 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 providers to uh, eradicate. I, I try to. I don't want to be sensationalist to eradicate and to to eliminate the contents. Uh, otherwise, uh, and after there is another thing. There is the trade-off between privacy and control. 
and this is another uh, uh, another controversial issue and uh, algorithms we saw that algorithms many times eat and ban illicit, illicit activities while searching for illicit activities we we can see that as well in the in the in the normal life of social networks so uh, another uh, we can say that uh, the, the, all the profits be, be, should be should be asked for accountability for and supervision of, of contents. Uh, I would like to to for a, for a while uh, to to focus as well on migrants uh, on migrants and technology. So uh, human trafficking is is a play. Migrants entering human trafficking because there are offers of fake jobs, uh, safe purchases on migratory routes. And the problem is to, to track, it's very difficult to track money, the circulate, to track money circulation because there are system of, uh, of uh, circulating money without any control on the internet. What, what we can do, because the last chapter of the pastoral orientation is responding to human trafficking. And, uh, the first is education and parental control, I would say, and culture, culture against this self-serving narcissism and this uh, primacy given only to, to technology on appearance uh, and case for image that we can see today in the, in the, on the internet. And uh, the role, uh, in, ed in educational parental control, of course, is to parents. And I think that uh, we have to raise awareness on the role and, and the dangers of technologies for, for just children having a smartphone that uh, a trafficker uh, could, could easily enter in. Another, and this I want to be sensationalist, is the problem of pornography and uh, the, as a Catholic, as a as as a special advisor of the Order of Malta and of the, of the Holy See, I would call for block and pornography providers and website uh, because there is no control. And many times uh, it was discovered that people were on, on this displays were uh, display on 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 in video without their willing. And providers, they didn't, uh, they didn't delete the, the, these contents. And the first thing is to call for web giants responsibility and accountability. This is very difficult and <laughs> I, I, I cannot go farther in this, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, issue because it, it goes very far. And uh, another another initiative could be partnership platforms and to to track human trafficking uh, to use the same technology to track human trafficking. But here we can open a, a pro another problem, another dilemma that is the is a, the nature of technology, information technology. If you have powerful or uh, means. And the traffickers have powerful means because what we are observing, what we are monitoring, that traffickers and criminal networks organization are using, are becoming very skilled in the use of uh, information technology uh, to create platforms and partnership to, to, to track human trafficking could be hand up in in creating an open market that they can breach an open market of victims uh, for retaliation or for other or for new abuses because uh, what the governments around the world are experiencing is our security breach in their uh, in their net in their internet uh, in the in, in their internet uh, securities uh, networks and uh, architectures structures so uh, the the catholic church uh, of course will will support technological and legal cooperation but uh, 
we have to be very careful and uh, and is still a no man's land the the creation of of uh, of uh, technological platforms uh, to to create database and uh, to use the information you say before from satellites it, because uh, it's very difficult to guarantee to guarantee the security of of these of these platforms and uh, technology is evolving so i would like to articulate uh, finally the on uh, the attention on three words care knowledge and culture so uh, the care the care that uh, we should have, we should have for our uh, our our younger uh, for for the younger in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, helping them in uh, in uh, support them in not leaving them alone in the t in the technology world the knowledge to understand what how these are these uh, means these technological means are evolving and culture and because both in raising awareness and both with in the schools in the with the always with the youngest to to avoid and to 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 help them to 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 escape these 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 dangers that are for everyone is on the way on the web. Uh, so not to mention that the Pope uh, remembers the the easiness of being part of the supply chain uh, on internet because we do, we 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 could easily we be a part without even even noticing. And uh, lastly, I would I would like to 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 suggest that the all these technologies or these uh, new contents, uh, pornography, social network, they have a profound impact on the thinking and behavior of children. And uh, those that I mentioned are the the action that should be support. Even is very difficult to do that. Thank you. Well, our technology is keeping up. Many thanks, Andrea. You're absolutely right. The replication of abuse using technology to double down on the abuse of minors and others in vulnerable situations is a clear and present danger to us all. Uh, on a related theme about the use of technology by traffickers, uh, we will now, I understand, Michelle, we will now cross to a video from Don Fortunato. Saluto cordialmente tutti i partecipanti a questa importante sessione eh, che affronta una delle tematiche più spinose, più importanti, che ci portano alla tutela dell'infanzia in un mondo veramente lacerato da situazioni così gravose che riguardano i bambini, il loro traffico e soprattutto il loro sfruttamento attraverso anche internet. Il tema che mi è stato affidato è un tema molto particolare, soprattutto eh, per quanto riguarda l'agire criminologico da parte dei pedofili online. Evidentemente noi dobbiamo stabilire alcuni punti fondamentali di questo crimine che avviene contro l'umanità e che sembra semplicemente virtuale. Dobbiamo sempre considerare che il virtuale è come se non esistesse, perché il virtuale è la vita reale degli uomini e pertanto anche attraverso internet eh, i soggetti criminali, pedofili e pedopornografi che hanno una perversione eh, per il godimento personale eh, nello sfruttamento dell'innocenza evidentemente hanno strutturato delle vere e proprie organizzazioni che portano in essere una eh, strategia ben definita eh, e soprattutto una strategia che ha come scopo oh, l'annientamento, oh, il sopruso, eh, la vendita, il traffico di bambini e qui non stiamo parlando ecco, di eh, poche centinaia di bambini, ma già anche solo un solo caso e un fatto gravissimo che avviene sotto i nostri occhi e che necessita la conoscenza da una parte, ma dall'altra parte anche interventi legislativi, interventi 
eh, investigativi, ma interventi soprattutto ecco, formativi, informativi, eh, dove la società deve, e anche la Chiesa deve rispondere per tutelare gli eh, innocenti, i piccoli del mondo. Ecco. Pertanto stabiliamo un fatto. La pedopornografia e la pedofilia sono un crimine su scala mondiale. Noi dobbiamo comprendere che eh, sempre più eh, non esistono confini geografici e Internet continua a essere terra di nessuno, una landscape indefinito e senza limiti, in cui la criminalità può agire quasi indisturbata. Molto spesso dai link analizzati da Meter risulta che l'estensione, se l'estensione del dominio, pur appartenente, pur appartenente geograficamente ad una nazione, contiene invece servizi forniti da server allocati in altre parti del mondo. Quindi immaginate attualmente dal nostro report 2020 emerge America e Europa sono le sedi principali dei server che gestiscono il traffico eh, delle informazioni e soprattutto il traffico eh, di minori eh, per quanto riguarda tutto il sistema criminale eh, che, si è stato che è stato impiantato, che è stato eh, costruito per ehm, sfruttare eh, l'innocenza e dall'altra parte anche anche ehm, fornire una serie di eh, sistemi finanziari che portano eh, un business criminale sulla pelle dei bambini. Pertanto, eh, chi utilizza Internet? Abbiamo visto che è un sistema globale, mondiale, a volte gratuito, viene fornito dai server provider, eh, c'è la possibilità di mh, andare a individuare anche delle zone paradisiache dove non c'è una legislazione sufficiente, o a volte debole, o a volte anche assente, e quindi la possibilità di poter usufruire i free eh, file hosting, cioè dire la possibilità di servizi gratuiti di file hosting, questo permette in maniera massiccia, in maniera molto intensa, ecco, una, oh, da parte dei soggetti pedofili e pedopornografi l'utilizzo e il traffico di bambini e di esseri umani. Ma chi è il pedofilo? Il cyber pedofilo è un individuo che trova nella rete la possibilità di soddisfare le proprie fantasie sessuali contravvenendo alle regole morali che la società in cui vive gli impone, inoltre riesce anche a soddisfare in maniera virtuale i propri impulsi. Tutto ciò non produce altro che una maggiore eh, devianza e soprattutto un allontanamento dalla vera realtà o, e quindi dalla vita reale. Da non sottovalutare inoltre la raffinata capacità da parte dei cyber pedofili di utilizzare al meglio la tecnologia per raggiungere i propri scopi. Esistono quindi diverse tipologie di pedofili che utilizzano la rete. Per le tipologie di pedofili possiamo benissimo dare un profilo, i primi sono i closet collector, cioè dire collezionista armadio, conserva gelosamente ecco, tutta la sua collezione pedopornografica e non è mai coinvolto in prima persona in abusi su minori. Abbiamo invece poi il collezionista isolato e un pedofilo che colleziona pedopornografia scegliendo una categoria in particolare ed è coinvolto direttamente nell'abuso sui minori. In questo contesto il eh, pedofilo eh, collezionista è colui che ha ad esempio eh, delle vere e proprie, eh, vere e proprie archivi, ad esempio con neonati abusati oppure preferisce soltanto le bambine di colore ehm, eh, bianco e eh, quindi di conseguenza magari con caratteristiche somatiche particolari, o i capelli biondi, o i capelli scuri, eh, oppure eh, soltanto bambini maschi di un'età un ben particolare, ben definita, con delle caratteristiche particolari. Ecco, il pedofilo collezionista veramente ha questa capacità ecco, di poter avere 
veri e propri mega archivi, qui stiamo parlando a volte nelle indagini e nell'individuazione di questi soggetti, si trovano decine di milioni di eh, immagini eh, che corrispondono a decine di milioni di bambini già coinvolti e già abusati. Poi abbiamo i cosiddetti collezionisti eh, commerciali, il commercial collector, che è eh, coinvolto personalmente nello sfruttamento sessuale dei minori e produce, produce copia, vende materiale pedopornografico. Ecco, qui, è ver- qui c'è veramente la struttura di organizzazioni o di congreghe o di gruppi eh, non più isolati ecco, che hanno implantato un vero e proprio commercio che è legato anche allo sfruttamento reale dei bambini emerge in maniera molto chiara che eh, i, co- i pedofili commerciali ecco, che commercializzano il materiale eh, si è verificato che anche il 40-50% sono soggetti che hanno abusato direttamente dei bambini e hanno poi fotografato, videato e commercializzato e dall'altra parte poi ecco, la vera e propria struttura organizzativa del pedocrime che è complessa e gerarchica che con il consenso forzato dei genitori a volte aggancia le piccole vittime per mettere a disposizione per scopi meramente di violenza sessuale al fine di trarre business economico con incontri reali e virtuali. Pertanto voi comprendete che saper pedofilo ha necessità di avere il bambino, cerca il bambino, eh, realizza materiale con il bambino e commercializza il materiale con il bambino che è già stato abusato. E questo è veramente uno degli elementi che forse dovremmo sempre più approfondire eh, per comprendere che non è soltanto una devianza eh, grave, gravissima, sessuale e di preferenza di bambini. Qui stiamo parlando che ormai i bambini sono entrati nel vero e proprio business e traffico di esseri umani di sfruttamento sessuale e dove ci sono vere e proprie organizzazioni. A tal proposito credo che sia necessario stabilire anche la classificazione stessa dei pedofili e dobbiamo dire che abbiamo eh, il pedofilo seduttore, è colui che è molto affettuoso, ha, fa molti regali eh, al bambino e, come, e con le sue abilità manipolatrici ne ottiene complicità garantendosi il silenzio. Abbiamo anche un'altra categoria eh, che è stata studiata e Meter ne ha dato molto contributo non soltanto a queste categorie ma anche ad altri sviluppi che hanno portato a una identificazione di ehm, elaborazione più raffinate del profilo del pedofilo. Immaginate eh, le, le pedofile mamme che eh, abbiamo trovato un filone, la cosiddetta pedomama, dove le mamme stesse abusano dei loro piccoli eh, ma eh, commercializzano il prodotto stesso dell'abuso che le mamme stesse compiono. Comunque c'è anche il pedofilo introverso, difficilmente utilizza approcci seduttivi e comunica pochissimo con i bambini. Un'altra categoria, un altro profilo è il pedofilo sadico e possiamo dire che è il più pericoloso, tra il piacere nel vedere soffrire fisicamente e psicologicamente il bambino, tende trappole e utilizza la forza per procedere a rapimenti con l'estrema conseguenza di uccidere la vittima. E poi il cyber pedofilo, che ne abbiamo accennato, ma abu- non abusa magari concretamente dei bambini, ma usufruisce del materiale pedopornografico e questo comporta evidentemente la, mh, l'abuso sui bambini reali e la produzione del materiale sempre più eh, avanzato e sempre più eh, come dire, strutturato lo abbiamo confermato nelle cose che già vi ho detto, e che trova su internet o tramite il commercio sommerso, pensate al deep web o al dark web, è un capitolo che secondo mio modesto parere dovrebbe essere molto più approfondito e dovremmo trovare il modo per superare il concetto della totale libertà online e quindi la tutela stessa della privacy e soprattutto della privacy nei confronti dei pedocriminali. Comunque sia, pur non producendo materiale, ne usufruisce. Il pedofilo telematico le, eh, fa aumentare evidentemente la richiesta eh, sul mercato mondiale della produzione di immagini e quindi gli abusi all'infanzia. Allora comprendete che nell'immaginario collettivo eh, così pensa che il pedofilo sia un mostro, un individuo eh, riconoscibile tra tanti, eh, in realtà è solamente una persona comune 
una persona molto comune, curata esteticamente e spesso con una buona posizione sociale, insospettabile e di solito molto vicina ai bambini, che può oscillare dalla figura del padre, dalla madre, da un parente stretto, ma anche e soprattutto può essere un soggetto che ha sottomesso, rapito, perché no, la questione dei bambini scomparsi può essere legata anche e perché no, abbiamo avuto riscontri di cronaca ecco, di bambini rapiti e soggiocati, schiavizzati per anni e anni interi e poi magari dopo tanti anni individuati. Il problema della pedopornografia, dovete comprendere, è, è, è legata evidentemente alla figura del pedofilo che stiamo cercando per quanto c'è possibile di dare un'analisi abbastanza obiettiva e soprattutto, da una parte moralmente parlando, inquietante, che necessita un intervento maggiormente incisivo a livello globale. Pertanto concludo eh, dicendo che il pedofilo evidentemente ecco, è più delle volte di sesso maschile e in prevalenza eh, questo aspetto e prova una forte attrazione sessuale verso i bambini prepuberi. Per prepuberi significa bambini al di sotto dei 12-13 anni, cioè dire che ancora non hanno a, non hanno la maturità sessuale e quindi possiamo in un certo qual senso, eh, dal punto di vista di genere, sì, maschili e femminili, ma anche indistinti nell'aspetto della maturità sessuale e quindi di conseguenza il pedofilo preferisce maggiormente eh, bambini di sesso femminile eh, e anche in questi contesti, in questi anni, sta aumentando tantissimo la produzione del materiale pedopornografico con bambini maschi bene, sempre prepuberi, è veramente un mercato molto, molto sommerso, ma è un mercato che ormai è emerso, perché le grandi e le numerose, le migliaia di, se, di segnalazioni e denunce, ma anche l'impegno delle forze dell'ordine in tutto il mondo, delle polizie che si prodigano a contrastare questo fenomeno, ma che deve essere ancora fatto molto di più, e ve lo posso garantire per l'esperienza trentennale che abbiamo noi della situazione Meter, ecco, ehm, ci permette di poter avere un profilo del pedofilo, come agisce, ma soprattutto eh, il grande dramma della commercializzazione dei bambini, perché eh, sono scarto, ma è uno scarto che frutta business economico per la criminalità organizzata. Eh, ecco, mi fermo qui, vi ringrazio per l'ascolto che mi avete dato, ecco, il tempo eh, limitato mi ha permesso di poter sintetizzare ecco, il tema che mi è stato offerto per quanto riguarda la eh, figura del pedofilo nel mondo del web e nel campo della pedocriminalità, eh, senza dimenticare comunque che la prevalenza che emerge è che il pedofilo, il pedopornografo o che commercializza e sfrutta i bambini ecco, fa il danno ai bambini, al futuro della nostra umanità. Vi ringrazio di cuore e buon proseguimento. Ok, Michelle, um, it's always, to have to say, I have to say, it's always seriously shocking to explore this world of child sexual abuse and pedophilia. And thanks for, to Don Fortunato for, for taking us through that. Uh, it reminds me just recently there was a, a poll at the end of last year in France. This is, this is not isolated, right? One in 10 children in France are abused by family members only. So if we think about the total numbers, we're really looking at a shocking, shocking situation. So um, please welcome our next panelist. Sean Cole is an attorney from the US working on child rights and trafficking cases the last 16 years. He's been with International Justice Mission for over 11 years, living and working in Southeast Asia, East Africa and Eastern Europe. So Sean, over to you. Great. Thanks to you, uh, Brian, and thanks to uh, Michelle and uh, Andrea and, and, and Father as well. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to, uh, to contribute uh, something, something small this evening. Uh, technology is, is like the apple. It can be, it can be uh, turned for, for bad and it can also be uh, something very, very good. Um, and so uh, it's something that, that has two sides of it. And, and I hope to explore a little bit about that uh, th this evening because there are things that we can do. Uh, there are things uh, in civil society as individuals, as law enforcement, both supply and demand side uh, that we can work on. 
Uh, I'm going to share uh, share some slides. Uh, if you could, uh, we could pull up the presentation. Great. Uh, if we could go to number one, we're giving people a sneak peek there. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so Internet, just to give you a little bit of background about uh, who we are, uh, International Justice Mission is a global organization that protects the vulnerable from violence by rescuing victims, helping to bring criminals to justice, restoring survivors to safety and strength, and helping law enforcement build a safe future that lasts. IJM utilizes a collaborative casework approach, working with government partners, uh, employing multidisciplinary teams of investigators, lawyers, social workers in cases of exploitation. IJM's casework, we actually use that as a diagnostic tool uh, to inform our programs, to inform advocacy and capacity building uh, with government and civil society partners. Uh, and I would like to stress the importance uh, of a holistic approach. So we must begin, also begin to look at trafficking through the lens of perpetrators determines what motivates their actions and concentrate our efforts to eliminate the benefits of trafficking. Both criminal accountability and financial disincentive both supply and demand. That will be the most effective way to address trafficking in human beings. We must also have agility and think outside the box we must be smarter and adapt to meet emerging trends and new criminalities that have moved to adopt technology for its benefit and use. We must also do the exact same thing and utilize technology to combat human trafficking. I'd like to talk to you a little bit uh, and share with you some of the ways uh, that technology that we have seen around the world at IJM in cases of human trafficking and exploitation. One significant and emerging trend is the use of technology to live stream the sexual exploitation of children. Father just uh, mentioned a little bit uh, about this. We often see that offenders connect using social media networks and then utilize text communication, many times encrypted, then send money from the demand side typically Western countries, but this can be from anywhere in the world, to supply side countries. After money has been exchanged, live streaming of sexual exploitation occurs many times at the live direction of the perpetrators in demand side countries. This is a significant problem today, and it is an emerging and growing phenomenon. Just since the COVID epidemic, we've seen a 31% increase in the child sexual exploitation material reports received by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the United States. Why is the United States relevant? It's because that is an agency that receives reports and tips from around the world that utilize US-based platforms and others that traffickers often utilize which you and I actually have many of those networks and platforms on our cell phone tonight. If you were to open up your phone right now, I almost guarantee you would have those platforms on there. In 2020 alone, we saw 21 million reports received by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children compared to 16 million in 2019. So nearly a, a five year, a five million uh, increase in one year. We also know that the Philippines uh, was an epicenter of this phenomenon. The Philippine Interagency Council Against Trafficking reported an increase of 300 percent in reports from 2019 to 2020. So what can be done? Well, there are innovations and tools that are being developed around the world that will require our advocacy. So I saw some comments there. What can we actually do? There are some things that we can do. There are advocacy uh, around ensuring that they are implemented. The latest artificial intelligence innovation and tools can be utilized to, to proactively detect 
and block images of live streaming sexual exploitation. Similar to large platforms that are currently removing and taking down images or even statements because of misuse, a similar approach could be utilized through artificial intelligence. Additionally, there must be requirements for individuals and corporations to report such abuse to law enforcement. These measures are critical because it helps with accountability and data measurement to determine the prevalence of live streaming. We must know and understand this phenomenon before we can adequately address it. This helps governments to better understand victimology and criminology, ascertain locations and levels of exploitation, which all support an evidence-based and targeted approach to prevention and timely rescue through law enforcement. These types of crimes often take place in the privacy of the home where there is no ability for victims to reach out to others, particularly when they are children. Thus, we need the actual providers and deliverers of the content to work responsibly to identify and help stop the behavior. Governments play a key role in combating the live sexual exploitation of children through policy and regulation. But we've actually seen a very slow understanding on the part of legislators and policy experts to take informed action. We need the development of very clear guidelines and accountability mechanisms for tech companies and finance and equally important, if not more important, financial institutions. Unless there is some form of accountability for both demand and supply side, uh, and I appreciate that that has been highlighted throughout this series, both demand and supply side. For the companies that are intermediaries for video and financial exchange, we will not see the decrease or any deterrent for this type of behavior. This problem is not going to go away without disruption of the behavior through criminal and financial accountability. It is our job to figure out how to do that. But we have seen some successes when law enforcement NGOs and others work together. From 2011 to 2019, International Justice Mission and the support of the government in the Philippines were able to secure the rescue of 527 victims and convict 70 individuals that may have never been caught otherwise and who could still be offending today. It is possible for NGOs to work with law enforcement to build better and smarter capabilities to confront this crime. We also need greater reg regulation of the financial intermediaries and institutions to understand the phenomenon and take a proactive role in thwarting their use and services by criminals. Companies must understand how their institutions are being utilized by criminal enterprises and take action to systemically report suspicious behavior and patterns rather than hiding it or turning a blind eye. We need to develop better policies and mandated reporting mechanisms. There are several other ways in which technology is used in other forms of human trafficking. Social networking has been mentioned this evening, and it's used all the time by recruiters to target vulnerable populations and recruit them for exploitation with promise of jobs or fictitious relationships. Mobile communication often occurs between traffickers, recruiters, and victims. We are working on a labor trafficking case currently where all of the communications and transport were, were arranged through social media from the UK to recruit vulnerable people in rural Romania. We also see online advertising coupled with private messaging. I know that we've discussed today, this evening, earlier with Father, the emergence of the dark web over the last several years, which is true and it is horrific. But we have actually seen in the majority of our live streaming cases that we've worked on in the Philippines that surface web-based applications are utilized in most cases. Surface web applications are easy to use and they're familiar to us all. In fact, that's their appeal to traffickers. 
In fact, if you open your phone right now, you will find all the applications a criminal might need to do any of the exploitive practices we have already discussed. We are not talking about high tech sophistication, and that is one reason why it has become so prolific. These are just basic apps that are on your phone and my phone. It is important to note that all of the good things that tech can be used for can also be used for bad. Research of particularly vulnerable groups, facilitation of travel, moving money covertly, obscuring identity, surveillance, and phone tracking. Criminals have all these tools readily available. All these innovations were developed for good, but unfortunately can also be used for bad. Think of a traffic tracking app. For me, I like to use that for my loved ones. It helps me know where they are, if they're late, if there's an accident or not. But it can also be used to coerce and maintain control over victims that might be working on the streets without the physical presence of a handler. In many of our cases of trafficking, uh, where there's cases of uh, handlers of victims, that may no longer need to be necessary if a victim must stay on a street and have their phone and app uh, and their location readily available for the trafficker, which might be uh, in a building close by. So that's uh, let's take a deep breath. <laughs> that's a that's a lot of bad news. And uh, between the last presentation, <laughs> two presentations uh, and this one, uh, we all uh, just might need to uh, take take a deep breath and uh, relax for a moment. But there are ways and there are things that we could do. So here's a little bit of hope. There are very concrete and practical ways that you and I can join the effort to combat trafficking with technology. We don't have to be hopeless. We can make a difference. And I can suggest some ways that IJM and its partners have found to make a difference. Technology can be used to block, map, and identify websites that promote harmful practices or hide exploitation that offer escort, massage, prostitution, or false employment opportunities. Technology can be utilized in targeted ways to reach victims through the same social media apps that we know vulnerable groups are using. So why not use those same smart messages that are pushed to individuals that will fall within the most prevalent vulnerable groups. Just as businesses target audiences, why shouldn't we also utilize this research market-based approach in order to reach persons traveling from countries of origin to destination with messages in their feeds? Uh, I don't know if you had this experience, but somehow I land, uh, you know, if I'm traveling in Europe and I travel from uh, the, the Netherlands to Rome, uh, the company is right there. They're, they're the first ones to, to greet me and welcome me to Italy, you know, because there's a new service provider, because they're going to make some money and they know that I've actually landed. So why can't we utilize that same exact technology to tell individuals that we know through our mapping exercises, where the most vulnerable routes are, what language settings are the most vulnerable groups, so that we can also push out messages if you have need. Uh, do you need any help? These are the emergency numbers. Why aren't we using that same type of technology? Rather than just using technology for money, why don't we actually use it to help share information? Uh, IJM is, is using some of these techniques about p pushing messages already in Southeast Asia and we'll be piloting them in our cross-border program in Europe soon. We have also included Survivor Voice in order to help us create relevant messages. And so having the leadership of a, of a survivor that has actually gone through an exploitive condition to actually formulate those messages. So we're sending relevant messages to individuals that we know are in vulnerable uh, areas. Additionally, if perpetrators use technology to reach out, try and recruit individuals, we can also use those same platforms. Dig a little deeper, find out who is behind some of these advertisements and platforms in order to determine if they are legitimate or not, 
or pose risks to vulnerable groups. These recruitment platforms must be visible. Otherwise, they would not be effective. We can utilize that fact and conduct investigations and analysis online to find and determine if some of those opportunities are really ruses to exploit people, particularly when we have reports from victims of abuse about some of these agencies or platforms. Now, I'd like to share a few ways in which we can present data to help us be more strategic in our efforts. We can use technology to help us better understand the trafficking phenomenon in order to strategically inform our investments to combat human trafficking. We need smarter, more relevant interventions formed by data. We can use technology to help us understand trafficking routes, forms of exploitation, travel corridors, and recruitment methodologies. This information is vital to help us become smarter and use all of our resources more effectively. Heat mapping, for example, when we have enough data, can help us determine where the crimes are occurring and what time and season they are most prevalent. This is an example of a heat map to help identify when, where, and how frequently crimes are occurring. Again, this is important to inform our strategies for effective and efficient prevention and rescue. I saw this technology actually utilized by the World Bank in Nairobi, Kenya, in a in a in a uh, an area that had a lot of crimes. For them to actually map the reports, uh, also via technology, uh, reports of crimes, so that they could actually enhance lighting, they could increase patrols, they can move individuals around in that area. This is an example of taking information from victims and cross-referencing that human intelligence from survivors with satellite imagery to understand border crossing routes. Our teams worked with partners to map all crossing routes accessible by vehicles from Cambodia to Thailand. We cross-referenced this information with victim statements and actual real cases that we were working on to begin to map the border crossings most used by traffickers. This information, government actors and NGOs can better focus with this information. We can all better focus our awareness, prevention, and inspection efforts. This slide shows the most prevalent routes for the trafficking of Romanians in Europe. This can also shape resource allocation for targeted awareness and rescue efforts. And so as individuals, if they're taking certain plane trips and they're a certain nationality and they're going to a certain airport, then you can target those individuals very specifically and provide them with the information that they need so they don't fall into forms of exploitation. This data shows a comparative uh, breakdown of labor versus sexual exploitation that require distinct approaches to create awareness campaigns develop targeted messaging and intervention strategies. This is using data to help tell a story. An innovative strategy that a partner of ours uh, in Romania, Eliberare, they developed uh, a website that attracted persons for with the ruse of easy money. Uh, their staff and volunteers attended festivals across Romania and gave out flyers and took photos with their pictures in euros and dollar bills. Um, through this, they were able to understand anonymized data of individuals who later visited the website. The age group that most frequently visited the site were between 14 and 16 year old girls. They were also able to identify key geographical markers. This information helps inform approach towards awareness raising. Once the visitor to the site penetrated a certain level, then a warning message was given that these types of unrealistic, lucrative offers can be dangerous and how to report a crime. If perpetrators are using technology for nefarious purposes, why can't we use it for good? We can and should develop and utilize technology to find practical ways of using trauma-informed strategies in individual cases. 
One such way uh, that we've utilized is to take best evidence through a video recording of witness statements that can be used later at court through supporting law enforcement. This decreases possible re-traumatization of victims and could allow victims that have been repatriated to their home country to still give testimony in destination countries where they were exploited without the need to travel there. Many times victims can be traumatized to return to those countries and it can be a very scary and intimidating process. The thought of seeing the perpetrator again in person may keep the survivor from engaging with the criminal proceedings, allowing the perpetrator to go free to abuse others. Thus, if their evidence in chief is taken by recording, then the victim may give their cross-examination testimony by remote link. This use of technology is gaining ground and is effective during COVID and during cases where victims have already been repatriated. We've supported, IJM has supported the live streaming of victim testimony from a rural town in Kenya to a courtroom in the UK. We should advocate for this type of procedures in each legal system. Another use of video recording includes victim impact statements. NGOs can and should advocate for this in each case where you're able to. There is a growing trend to video record victim impact statements so that a court can understand the full impact that the exploitation had on victims and their families. Report, recorded impact statements are used in some jurisdictions by the court to consider sentencing or compensation. Video recorded victim impact statements may require additional work on the part of law enforcement and NGOs, but it can be very powerful. We have a case where individuals were recruited and exploited for labor in the construction industry in the UK. With that, just these facts alone, if heard by a judge in the UK, may not be that compelling. However, seeing a person, hearing their story, and they took from their meager life savings to pay for the job opportunity and actually took out loans that they and their family are still paying back, showing physically where they currently live in a one room house for a family of eight can give a judge a little bit better understanding of the depth of the impact on real people's lives. And that's a story that deserves and should be told. This allows a survivor to share their real and personal story, giving them voice that they may otherwise not have had. This is important for the sentence and potential reparation or compensatory ruling, depending on the jurisdiction. So the message is one of urgent need, but also of hope. Technology in and of itself is not bad, and it is here to stay. But we must adapt and utilize it for good. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks very much, Sean. The simultaneous attraction and danger of the apple of the technology tree and smarter use of data is a great clarion call. Thanks also for the good news in your presentation. That was very much needed, to be frank. So uh, let's have a look at some of the questions. Uh, so we had a question from uh, Yvette Stevens. Uh, I heard that young boys are being lured to uh, uh, for human traffickers to become international footballers. International football is being seen as a way to rise to fame and trafficking traffickers are taking advantage of this. Um, I saw Sean posted a short reply to that, as I did already. Uh, does, does anybody want to say anything more about that one? I'll just add that, that there are some really good NGOs that are, are focused on this, particularly ones looking from, from Africa to, uh, to Europe. And those are phenomenal NGOs. I would encourage you to, to seek them out, to find them, to see how you can support them. Uh, and there is, that is an actual, uh, ruse. And I think I would agree wholeheartedly with what Brian said. It's, uh, there, there's very different, many different stories. Uh, but it is something that, 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 tries to take on hope, 
tries to hope of a better life, of a better condition, of grass is greener on the other side. Any way that that story can be manipulated and told, it will be told. Um, uh, so it's 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 really tricking someone. So um, yeah, so that is a definitely a, a ruse out there, and there are NGOs working on it, which is very important. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It always struck me that there was this terrible sadness around the cases of trafficking when you looked at a, a village, for example, and you looked at who was trafficked and who wasn't. It tended to be the dreamers who were most at risk, right? They were the ones who were actually eventually the ones. And, you know, so these are the brightest in many ways, the brightest in a community that say, I've got a dream, the golden road, the open up a shop in Bangkok or whatever. They've got this dream and it's that dream that's taken advantage of. And that's one of the very saddest features, I think, of human trafficking globally is the abuse of this dream, the killing of the dream. So uh, without more ado, um, Ediberto has posed the question, problem using technology is the need for funding. It's easy for the syndicates to use it since they have financial resources. So how can we use technology without needing more financial resources? Who would like to have a go at that thorny question? Andrea's got a smile. I think he wants to do it. No, uh, just to say that this is the problem that we are experiencing and uh, so uh, I think our role, uh, what we can do is advocacy to states because states can intervene, states can have the, uh, can have the instruments, can have the mechanism, can have the funding, they can decide to, to use the, fun the funds to, to work on this because you can create platforms you can you can you can use in a in a in a small scale your technology but to to give a substantial response to the phenomenon only the national states can do that i think mm -hmm. michel yes my no i i think uh, i like very much what uh, uh, Sean said, but also uh, the answer by Andrea. Uh, definitely, states should understand that uh, uh, human trafficking is not a side crime, is a threat to national and international security. So, if they take this uh, as a threat to national and international security, they will find the needed resources to deal with it. And indeed, it's not necessarily NGOs, nor the other Malta, nor possibly UN agencies, but uh, possibly, uh, definitely, uh, uh, states alone, or better even in cooperation, regional cooperation or uh, universal cooperation, uh, uh, could uh, uh, actually find the resources, find uh, also the human resources, the technological resources, to deal with uh, uh, those issues. Yeah, it's not really about lack of money. If you look at how much money is spent globally on counter trafficking, it's really about the allocation of, of, of the allocation of those resources within the bucket uh, and 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 the will, the will to tackle things. So uh, Yvette Stevens uh, has asked, uh, we've heard about what NGOs are doing now. What about what governments are doing in affected countries? Anybody? Sean. Sure. Uh, well, we can offer, uh, you know, our, our partnership in the Philippines. I mean, the, the Philippines was the epicenter uh, globally, as it recognized, of uh, live streaming. And uh, they actually uh, sat down, individuals within the Philippines government sat down with key NGO leaders and plotted a course uh, forward and were able to, to open up and, and authentically share information to uh, be honest uh, and genuine about data or the lack of their ability to get data. Uh, and then they were work, able to work closely with, with experts in, in, from a vulnerable position saying, we would like some, some assistance. Uh, whether that's through other law enforcement around the world. Uh, so I think uh, kind of hiding behind, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm law enforcement or I'm government, we don't need any help. Um, 
which we encounter and sometimes in, in various different countries, we need to break that, that, that glass and just say, no, it's going to take absolutely everybody at the table to work on this. Uh, nobody can puff and say, oh, I've got all the answers. Uh, we need to address supply. We need to address demand. Uh, and we need to share data uh, and be authentic about it. So really partnerships, uh, funding allocation in the right areas um, could could be very, very helpful. Passing policies that will hold uh, companies uh, and financial institutions accountable. You can't just turn a blind eye when all of the money is coming through certain financial institutions. You You must... You have a proactive duty to come up with uh, ideas around what are the indicators, what are the markers. Okay, you know, they, they can figure those out. We were able to partner with the Philippines government, Australian Federal Police, the U.S. and others, Nordic Police. Uh, we, there was a there's a study look, uh, that that looks at uh, live streaming, the prevalence thereof, uh, and they came up with markers. They came up with countries that uh, those markers are most relevant to. We have to begin to get to data and information and sharing, and we can't uh, uh, keep that hidden anymore. And we have to hold individual platforms and also financial institutions accountable. Then they will start. Then they will start changing. Uh, we have another question. Uh, we can take another question, Michelle. Yes. Yeah, so this is from. Um, yeah. Could I just add uh, an answer to what Sean said? Because I think no. need, uh, we need platforms. We need networks. Uh, and networks of uh, governments and also civil society. And uh, uh, first of all, one example is the Santa Marta Group. The Santa Marta Group is actually was established by Pope Francis, and uh, you have there uh, Catholic bishops working with law enforcement authorities from various governments. And now it's opening up to other religions. So I think it's very important. And also, for example, here uh, we have now uh, uh, Renate. We have a, a person from Renate uh, in attendance, but uh, you have also uh, uh, Talita Kum. Let me say, you have uh, 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 clearly, you have networks also of religious uh, congregations. And uh, uh, I must say, we had, uh, for example, uh, uh, in uh, a previous webinar, we had uh, someone from the uh, uh, Bon Pasteur, this uh, 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 Christina Duranti, and Christina Duranti was an excellent speaker, and you see that uh, some of those religious congregations have uh, managed at least part of technology. Uh, and we should uh, we should actually encourage this, uh, and we we should possibly try to team up with them. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, Mary Patricia Mulhall has asked a question directed at Sean. Uh, very informative. How do you get across the message to thirteen to sixteen year olds in the UK who will see this as out there, and this would never happen to me? Yeah, great question. Uh, and th that was actually a, one of the efforts of the uh, our partner, eLiberare, in, in Romania. They actually developed this website. Uh, they they It was an easy money. And many young people think they are invincible. This isn't going to happen to me. Uh, and this message kind of slapped them right in the face and said, <laughs> you, you actually took the bait. You actually went down this path. Uh, and by I also identifying the 13 to 16 year old uh, children and the geography, then you can actually target prevention and education uh, strategies rather than having kind of a, a broad strategy all over the country uh, that, that spends tons of money. You can have targeted uh, interventions. Uh, and so also having survivor informed and uh, this webinar series did a fantastic job. Uh, Michelle and Brian, uh, I believe it was two seminars ago that had the forced prostitution uh, highlighted and what that was and having those survivors speak into uh, prevention strategies of talking to people. They should be leading and highlighted and put on platforms uh, such as these speaking into this. This is how it happened to me. This is what happened to me. 
and they are uh, very vulnerable to come and to share their story. But that story is powerful and it's real. And for a 13 to 16 year old person to hear that or to meet one of those individuals, uh, I think they would they would pause. Uh, I know that at least those in my family would would pause and would listen to that individual. Uh, there is something that they have uh, that they have gone through that they can share and they're sharing out of a place of vulnerability, which is really a tremendous gift to each one of us. And so uh, having more platforms for individuals like that, not in a um, poorly designed way, uh, but really in an empowering way, someone that has come out of uh, a situation of exploitation and that is empowered through it and can speak with an empowered voice, have those individuals leading this effort. That is powerful and that will make a change. And so uh, I would encourage any opportunity to find individuals like that, uh, that they can tell their story, not from a sad, not at the end of the uh, seminar or the end of a webinar, but really leading that process. That's what we need. And that can have great impact with individuals in that age group, I believe. Next question. Perhaps this one I'll give Andrea. Uh, Yvette asks, uh, what steps are social media platforms to identify and ban traffickers from their sites? Are they doing enough? And if not, how can we get these social media uh, folks to intensify their efforts in this direction. Is this a question for you, Andrea, perhaps? Uh, you know, very, uh, it's a very good question. And I would like to know the answer. No, I jo I'm joking. <laughs> um, do you know, there are ma several cases where uh, parents and uh, civil society try to, to, to make pressure, to push, to advocate, to advocate for several cases where they found the children have problems or people were lured and we can say that few times few times several times uh, there are cases where the social networks providers respond and help and other were not they they were not so uh, we cannot count on uh, we hope this time is going is going to be okay or they are going to do something we should uh, we should advocate to have uh, the to have the national states who have the the responsibility for security of their citizens because you can be in the web but you are still, you can be around through the web, around the world through the web, where you are still a, a citizen from your country. Uh, they should pretend uh, new legal instruments with uh, social networks uh, and uh, to, 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 to protect their citizens. So there are, but are they uh, sufficient? I don't know, uh, because what we, we see that there are cases where they do something, other cases where nothing was done. And if I can uh, allow myself to think about what social network, how social networks and providers control political information, uh, COVID information, they are very prompt, they are very punctual, they, on uh, fake news, on news or, or political problematic contents, why they cannot uh, uh, reinforce their commitment on these kind of situations. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Andrea. So we have another question. Uh, so this one is about uh, financial institutions. They're very close mouthed about sharing how they address money laundering related to human trafficking, which would help those working in finance develop greater awareness. How can we get financial institutions to be more open to sharing information in the anti-trafficking effort? Well, that's a rich question. Uh, I'm going to give that one to Sean again, because I think that he's probably been working with some financial institutions in what he's been doing. And I would also just indicate that there are projects related to this. And I'll put a, put a note there in the column for the FAST initiative, finance, Financial Institutions Against Slavery and Trafficking. Uh, it was one of the ones I mentioned right at the beginning uh, of my intervention where data about impact and outcomes really, really hard to get. Uh, they do seem to be collaborating. They have in the Netherlands, for example, passed information on identified cases. 
Uh, my understanding is it hasn't led to very much uh, in global terms in, with regard to prosecutions, but there are some initiatives and the FAST initiative maybe is the best uh, example of that. So, Sean, over to you if you have anything more you want to say about this financial institution. Yeah, great, in great, rich question. Thanks, Brian, for the uh, referral. Uh, fantastic yeah. question. Um, I, I think there, there's different ways that we can uh, address that. One is to uh, demand uh, that through your legislators, those that represent you, uh, that, that we actually require this, that this is an important issue uh, and that we require a proactive approach, um, mandatory reporting development of tools to identify these markers. Uh, there's a, set, a study on uh, IJM website. If you go to the website, you can look at the uh, study done with the Philippines and joint uh, study jointly done with the Philippines. It actually, they were able to identify markers, uh, countries, amounts of money, um, how frequent, is it every Saturday night? Is it, you know, all these different markers that, that can uh, companies and financial institutions can, can actually come up with and utilize and develop algorithms. They can develop algorithms and information to uh, make a lot of money. Uh, they can also do similar algorithms to actually begin to identify and uncover patterns uh, of, of trafficking. So, there are some of these things uh, around the world that are developing so we can require that of our financial institutions, of social media platforms, but also uh, through our legislators and our, our governments. And we say that this is a key, this is an issue. Make it one of your policy uh, issues. Make it an advocacy issue. Bring it to light. People do not know very much about this or, or how can we actually address it. Um, begin to talk to your legislators so they feel uncomfortable when you ask them that question. They don't have any uh, answers for you. They will have their aides or they will have their assistants go and find out that information. That's what starts to move things. That's what creates awareness. So those are some of the ways. Uh, better regulation of the e, uh, of, of financial institutions within the EU, within Australia, within the U.S. Uh, are some other mechanisms that could um Require them to uh, to share it for share information. Wrap it up now, uh, Michelle. Uh, nod your head. Yeah, thanks. So thanks very much to Andrea, Don Fortunato, and Sean for your uh, inputs tonight for being on the panel. Uh, so just in wrapping up, uh, the vast majority of measures, including in the tech field, remain focused on supply side of human trafficking, and I would argue, and I hope you agree, that's. You know, 99% of measures being on the supply side is rather insufficient balance. Let's work to find a better blend of measures that together and only together can reduce the actual incidence of trafficking. Uh, and, and just one last point. If, if we can fly a drone on Mars, which we did last week, there's nothing but focus and will stopping us from better harnessing technology to identify and prosecute cases of trafficking. Uh, and let me... If, uh, on that point, cross to Michel for his uh, closing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, Sean, and Andrea, and actually also to Don Fortunato. Uh, indeed, uh, at the end of this webinar, I would like also to thank uh, uh, not only the organizers, but also uh, our webmaster, Yves Reichenbach, and my assistant, Clara Izepi. My gratitude. Uh, for all speakers for their clear, powerful statements and witnesses. And you could find also in the handouts uh, uh, documents which will be helpful for you to uh, complement uh, uh, their uh, interventions tonight. Since October, we have recorded and subtitled in English and French 10 webinars dealing with the role of religious orders in fighting human trafficking advocacy in fighting human trafficking, impact of human trafficking on health, healing and helping victims along the road to recovery, international prosecution of human trafficking, demand as root cause for human trafficking, sex trafficking and prostitution, and the importance of monitoring supply chain control and the role of consumers. I encourage you to visit the christusliberat.org uh, website where you will find the videos of these 10 webinars and a treasure chest of best practices as well as access to a free online course 
on human trafficking for helpers. And uh, actually, those videos are subtitled in uh, English, French, and Spanish. And we shall continue our webinars, first with two webinars in French with English subtitles on the 11th and 18th of May, so next uh, uh, two uh, Tuesdays. And for French-speaking people, I would like to stress that uh, those uh, uh, two webinars will be first dealing with uh, legal issues and the second uh, with assistance to human trafficking. <laughs> so thank you very much to everyone and uh, uh, hope to see you uh, soon, as soon as uh, next uh, Tuesday. Uh, have a good evening or a good day and uh, goodbye now. Thank you. Bye, everybody.